All right, so Genesis 14, and we want to look at the first 16 verses. So let's go ahead and look at it here. Probably a story that, that not the most familiar story regarding Abraham. Abraham becomes this warrior, right? He, he goes to battle. Um, so let's see what it says here. In the days of Arma fell, Ar- Am Raphael, you can't pronounce it either. Yeah, what he said. King of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elessar. Then this name, Chador Leomer. Now, your spelling might be different than my spelling. Uh, it, so, so if you have King James or something else, mine is, starts with a CH, yours may start with a K. So you got CH. So I'm doing a CH, yours might be a K. I don't know why it's different. It could be a challenge with, uh, we're reading Hebrew, but it's, it's, a, it's a non-Hebrew name. So I assume that's the issue there. Um, now, you have to spell all these correct on the uh, quiz at the end. King of Elam, entitled King of Goyim. The I-M there is, is important. Um, these kings may war with Bera, King of Sodom, Bersha, King of Gomorrah, Shinab, King of Adma, Shen. Shemi Burr, king of Zeboim, notice the I am there again, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, and all these joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Chedorlaomer, Mer, Mer, I don't know, but in the thirteenth year they re- rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with them came and defeated the Raphaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim. And Zozim and Ham and Amim and Shabbat Kiriathayim. Here you go. That's, that's the winner right there, folks. And the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Haz- Hazazan Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, so there's your five, their allies here, that is Zoar, went out. They joined battle in the valley of Sidim with Chedor Leomer, king of Elam, title king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elasar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the position of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and all his possessions and went their way. The one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and of Anir. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained man, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them to Hopa, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen, a lot with his possessions, and the women and the people. Now, if you get past the, the hard-to-pronounce names... What we got here, folks, is war. We got an action scene, right? Yeah. <laughs> and all, the, all God's men said, amen. It's about time, Jesus, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. We're done with the love stuff right for now. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. But now we got war. Now we're talking. I was, I was reading this, this story this week, and uh, many of you all know my, my deep affection for all things Tolkien. His first book of the Middle Earth uh, series that he published was The Hobbit. The Hobbit was supposed to be a contained story, and that's it, but it was really popular. It was written more of, for, for children. So if you read The Hobbit and then you read the sequels, Lord of the Rings, they're very different in tone. The Hobbit is, is really a great book to read to, to young kids, young readers. Uh, Lord of the Rings is, is much more difficult, much, and then Silmarillion is even just impossible at times. Well, The Hobbit, the climax of The Hobbit is a great battle. So you have everything building up to this battle. And if you read it, there's a chapter dedicated called The Battle of, of the Five Armies. And the entire battle is summarized in about one sentence. Bilbo, the hobbit, the titular uh, hero, he is asleep the entire time. He's actually knocked out. So you have this great finale battle that is very short. Your hero is knocked out for all of it. And that's your great climactic battle. 
battle. However, when they translated that into a movie, they put The Hobbit into three movies. The third movie is called The Battle of the Five Armies, and that battle is about two hours long. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a paragraph in the book. It is two hours of drama and fighting in, in, in the movie. Now, I'm not, I'm not against that. They do the same thing in Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. The great battle against the White Witch, and Aslan comes and, you know, and sets everyone free and all that. It's very short. It, it's, it's like a paragraph or a page or something like that. But in the movie, it's, it's much more dramatic, so they have to make up a lot of stuff and, and everything. Uh, well, what you have here is something like that. What you have is a lot of buildup. In fact, we've been building up to this with Lot from the very beginning. The, the, the writer has been telling us, Watch for Lot. He's not important yet, but he's going to be important soon. Watch for him. He's related to Abram. He's related to Abram. And then we get the separation. Uh, and then what happens? Lot thinks he's going to the Garden of Eden. But what he finds is a wilderness of violence. Abram is given a wilderness, but what he makes out of it is a Garden of Eden. That, that, that's the big point of the chapter. So we leave off at chapter 13. Lot thinks he's, he's found paradise. What he found was chaos and war. What he finds is what man does to the Garden of Eden. So what you have among the nations with this supposed Garden of Eden is what Adam and Eve did to their Garden of Eden. So it's going to take the people of God to, to reclaim and to rescue the earth, if you will. And, and we'll do that through redemption. That, that's, that's the main point of, of this entire story. But the battle itself is one verse, maybe two. I think the second verse is very short. They lose, and then they jump into tar pits. Right? I mean, that's, that's it. That's, that's, that's the whole, whole battle, at least as it is told. Well, let's start with the setting here. Um, this section describes a war between four foreign kings and five local kings in the Dead Sea area. And of course, this is where, where Lot chooses to go in the Transjordan Valley. Now, Canaan was occupied by several city-states. So don't think of Canaan as one nation, and, and there's a king over that. This is essentially what the, the Israelites come into when they enter Canaan, the promised land from Egypt. They have to destroy Jericho, and then they got to go to Ai, and then they got to go to here and there and everywhere, because they're really ruled by, by city-states. That's a really kind of a foreign idea to us. I guess the Greeks were among the last of the major nations to, to, to go about it this way, um, and then that was... Um, taken over by Alexander the Great, of course. But, um, but that's the way Canaan operates. So, so they, they have a shared ethnicity, shared religion, shared language, all that sort of stuff. But they each have their own little king and kingdom, all part of a, of, of a broader identity. Uh, sort of like 50 states, one nation. Uh, not quite, but that may be the closest parallel. If we did it right, we've become more of a nation than 50 states. I'm a states' right guy. I'm a federalist. I prefer 50 states rather than one nation because why should we tell California what to do? I guess it's okay for California to tell us what to do, apparently. But nevertheless, um, uh, I like to keep the policies of Chicago in Chicago, right? But I'm a bigot, apparently. So um, now what this narrative also does is it adds another challenge to the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, the, the big challenge is Abraham is supposed to be a dad. But he and his wife are beyond child-rearing age. Oh, let's add another problem to it. He's a sojourner in a violent land. His life is constantly at risk. <laughs> right? Let's just make it a little more complicated. And, and so it, it does that. Um, uh, yeah. So verse 1, we, we meet the foreign kings. There's four of them. Um, Am Raphael, king of Shinar. Now, Shinar may sound familiar because we meet Shinar in chapter 10. Remember the, the table of nations. Right? And this leads up to, to the Tower of Babel. So Shinar, we see, is a descendant of Ham. So you have the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, Canaan, the sons of Cush, the beginning of the kingdom of Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. So, so when you're reading through this, particularly if you're a Hebrew and you're trying to figure out the nations, particularly remember the gods rule the nations, God rules the nation. And so they view these nations in theological ways. And we don't think of it like that as, as Christians, but certainly the, the early Jews would. And so when they hear Shinar, they hear Ham. You remember Ham, it was his son, Canaan, who, who was cursed. And so the Hamites aren't the good guys. More than likely, you meet a Hamite, they're not, not going to be, be a good guy. Um, so... And Raphael is not mentioned outside of the Bible. Uh, his name means sayer of darkness, fall of the sayer. You do with that whatever you want. I mean, it sounds like the sort of name you'd read in a fantasy novel. 
it's the necromancer of Middle Earth or something like that. I, I don't know. Um, Arioc, king of Elisar. Arioc means lion-like, and that, that, that makes sense. It's almost like Nimrod, uh, warrior, whatnot. Um, um, the location of this place is quite difficult. Most associated with, with Ashur or Larsa in the land of Assyria. So here we have, again, sons of Ham. Um, from that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh. Um, and so uh, it's very possible there's association with, with this king and his kingdom and, and Ham again. Um, by the way, Arioch, as far as from, from what I've been able to find, is an established historical character. We find him um, in, in, in outside the Bible. Not that you need that to say these are historical people, but um, it does give more credence to the Bible, that this is consistent with what we know of, of, of that historical time. Uh, there is another Arioch in the Bible. He's in Daniel. He was uh, the chief of the executioners for Nebuchadnezzar. So there you go. I guess if you're going to be an executioner, you need to have a name like a lion. Um, Cheddar, I'm going to call him Cheddar, king of Elam, uh, means slave of Legamer. You can see it in, in the last part of his name uh, right there. So that would be the, the god. That's, that is a, uh, it's, it's a god. It is a, an Elamite god. Um, and he is, for what we can tell, a descendant of Shem, which is fascinating because Abram is a descendant of Shem. Uh, oh, I didn't put it up there. Uh, but yeah, I did. Genesis 10, to Shem, also the father of the children of Eber. That's where we get Hebrew. Um, the elder brother of Japheth's children were born sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram. So possibly a descendant of Shem. Finally, there is title. Title of the king of Goyim. Title means great son. It's likely a generic name for the king of Goyim, uh, like Caesar or Pharaoh or Mr. President. Uh, it's just a generic term. Um, there's some debate about that. We, 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 we made... There is a person who has a similar name, um, it may, that may not be him. That's kind of why we think it's a, it's a generic title. Uh, there is another. Uh, Goyim means, uh, it means nation, uh, Gentiles. Yeah, it's a generic term as well. So what you have is a generic king name of a generic Gentiles. So, so yeah, you have, you have your five kings or your four kings. But, you know, uh, Goyim is mentioned later in Joshua. And so there's, there's a lot of debate as to how to understand this. The I am there is plural. So it's the nations, the Gentiles uh, there. And you see it uh, very soon later. Okay, so then we get the Canaanite kings in verse 2. So um, there are uh, four local kings going up against five Canaanite kings or uh, foreign kings. Now, each of these five nations are linked elsewhere in Scripture. So here, here's your two examples. Genesis 10 takes us back to the table of nations. The territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar, as far as Gaza in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. So, uh, so most of these are, are mentioned throughout. Also, you see in Deuteronomy. Now, why is this important? Where are the, the Israelites going? They're going into an occupied land, and, and they're going to deal with, with these descendants. Whole land burned out with brimstone and salt, nothing sown and nothing growing, where no plant can sprout or overgrow. Like, like that of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, while the Lord overthrew his anger and wrath. Right? And there's, there's other places where, where these are, are mentioned. Now, outside of the Bible, uh, both Sodom and Zeboim are possibly mentioned on the Ebla tablets. Um, I think Sodom and Gomorrah, my theory, and this is just me making this up, so it's probably not true. Um, I think they are uh, made up names by the Jews. I, I uh, because Sodom means burning, Gomorrah means submersion, and that fits their story. So I'm not surprised if we don't find a lot of references to Sodom and Gomorrah. They very easily probably went by a Canaanite name, and the Jews perhaps gave them a name meaning burning and submersion uh, as a constant warning uh, of, of what happened. Um, Barak, we start with Barak, king of Sodom. Yeah, okay, so Barak, king of Sodom. Barak means son of evil, so don't name your child that. Um, Bersha means with iniquity. Don't name your child that. Uh, uh, Gomorrah, of course, we talk about that. Um, yeah, and the reference to Sodom and Gomorrah there, of course, is going to heighten the, the danger of Lot and why Abram is going to go. 
uh, Shinab, splendor of the family. Well, that, that could be a good name if you want a pagan. King of Adma means red earth. Um, Shemibur, Shemember, I don't know. Lofty height. Uh, that sounds like a, a pagan name, sort of idea of, of the gods. King of Zo- Zeboim, the gazelles. Notice the plural there. It's not gazelle, it's gazelles. Um, and then uh, King of Bella, uh, which we'll, we'll know Bella as Zoar. It's where Lot is going to end up. So Bella means destruction. Don't name your kid that. Zoar, insignificance. Don't name your boat that, okay? <laughs> you know, uh, if you ever build your own kingdom, you know, you, you're rich enough to buy yourself an island, don't name it Zor, Zoar. Uh, so, so there you go. So, so the setting, you've got four local kings fighting off the five foreign armies. In verses 3 to 7, they, they, they are arraigned. Um, and so what we see in verses 3 and 4 is the five Canaanite cities or nations had been vassals to the Elamite king Cheddar for 12 years, right? So they're paying tribute and there is support and all that sort of stuff, but they are under Cheddar's uh, thumb. In the 13th year, the Canaanites, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, all them, they form a coalition. They say, we're, we're tired of paying these high taxes, right? They don't support us. This is like the, the United Nations. And, and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah like Brexit, you know? Um, I don't know how you would put exit and Sodom and Gomorrah in there, but however you would, I'm sure you can hashtag it. And so the Canaanite form, nations formed their military alliance in the Valley of Sidim. That phrase is found nowhere else in the Bible. So it's just here where you're going to see this. Now, and then they go and they gather at the Salt Sea. That's a term for the Dead Sea um, because it has the highest salt content of any body of water in the earth at 30%. By the way, the Great Salt Lake in Utah um, is between 6 and 27%. So uh, we have our own Dead Sea here in America. I I taught uh, geography my first year um, at BTB, and uh, everything that we, all the landmarks and everything, what was unique about nations and continents we talked about, all the students started to realize we have all of that in the U.S. We do, from mountains to valleys to deserts to salt seas to rivers to um, oceans and gulfs and and all that. We've got it all here. It may not be as cool and awesome, but we've got... We've got the Walmart and Kroger brand of them, right? And so, um, I, I, of course, I went to uh, Salt Lake City, didn't get to see Salt Lake. But I brought back some of the salt for it and gave it to the kids and stuff um, for whatever that, that is worth. So, so they, they're going to stop paying tribute. Whenever that happens, they go get their money. Right? And, and so Cheddar rounds up the boys, his five nations, and he says, this, this, is, this is enough. We're, we're not going to put up with this. So in verses 5 to 7... Cheddar declares war to subjugate these cities and nations again. Of course, when he subjugates them, he's going to increase the tribute. That'll teach him a lesson. Um, And so what he does is he he takes his allies and he he, he squashes it. And what he does is these four armies, they, they get together to rebel. And it can only be those four armies because Cheddar takes over all these other areas. So these other potential allies are knocked out almost immediately. So you see it in there, this is verses 5 to 7, just because the names get so distracting. So the Rephaim and Ashtaroth Karnaim. Ashtaroth is probably going to stick out to you. That's a, Canaan, that's a, it's a Babylonian god, right? So you got Baal or Baal and Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth is going to be a real problem later on. Um, particularly the story of Elijah and Elisha and all those. So we went through the story of Elijah a few years ago. Now, according to Deuteronomy 3.13, I don't have it up there, uh, the Rephaites inhabited Bashan. And this will play an important role in Deuteronomy. We'll, we'll see that here in a minute. And Ashtaroth was the capital city of Bashan, again, according to Deuteronomy and Joshua. So he goes and he, he takes care of them, wipes them out. Okay. Then he goes to Zuzim in Ham. And I do think Ham is purposely put there to remind us of the Hamites, right? These are all bad guys <laughs> in, in general. Thirdly, he goes to Emim and Shave Kiriathaim, as located in Moab. Of course, the Moabites are going to play an important role later. And of course, Ruth is a Moabite. And uh, that means David is a descendant of a Moabite. David's great-grandmother, is that what she is? Is a Moabite. And so David flees to the Moabites. Remember last year in 1 Samuel, he flees to the Moabites. Um, and then when he's king, he defeats the Moabites. 
So there is, there's a real funny relationship the Jews will have with the Moabites. Now remember that the Jews reading this, uh, assuming Mosaic authorship, not holding Mosaic authorship, they're reading these things as they're about to enter the promised land. And what it is they're getting is these people are rough. They have a long history of roughness. But then later generations are reading this and they're saying, oh, we know the Moabites. Not much has changed. Uh, we, 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 we know about the Rephaim, as we'll see, it's connected to Goliath. Um, the Horites, it's a generic term for the people in Canaan and the Transjordan, uh, so likely smaller city-states he's, he's conquering. The end Mishpat, that is Kadesh. Kadesh will play an important role in the Old Testament. The Amalekites and the Amorites. Do you recognize those names? Yeah, it's early. It's the early part of those nations. It's the Amalekites that Moses, who has to hold up his, his arms, remember? And you got, I think it's Joshua and Caleb, or Aaron and whoever. He's got to hold them up, right? When they're up, they're winning. When they're down, they're losing. The Amalekites will play a role uh, later on. Um, is uh, the bad guy in Esther... Hanan. Is he, he's a descendant of Malachites, right? Isn't that who Saul was supposed to slaughter and let the king live? And that's where you get Haman, not Hanan. Haman is a descendant of, of that. And so he has an axe to grind against the Jews, which is why he turns against the Jews in the story of Esther. Um, and the Amorites, of course, are, are around there. Um, so there you go. Now, let's pause there. I, I know you're thinking, okay, these nations mean nothing to me. But, but there's more here than may meet the eye. Remember, the, the original readers aren't in the 21st century white America, okay? Rather, it, they, they, are, they are marching into Zion, right? And, and, and what happens here informs us to what they're going to experience in Deuteronomy, which is why Deuteronomy is, and Joshua are two important books to, to, to understand this. I want to highlight three of the, these people groups. The Rephaim. The Zuzites, which later will be called the Zamzamites. This is, this is all going to be on the quiz. And the Emites. Now, the, these, they, they, they're intertwined, so I'll spend most of my time on the Rephaim. Um, the reason this is important is because these three people groups, these three cities, nations, whatever you want to call them, throughout the Bible, particularly in Deuteronomy and Joshua, where, where they really show up again, they are portrayed as giants and were among the original settlers of the Transjordan. Okay? So it's going to get real trippy all up in here. We've done this a little bit when we talked about the Nephilim. Remember, if you go back to Genesis 6, what do we have? We, we have the Nephilim, right? The sons of God, daughters of men come together and, and they, they create the Nephilim. And there's a lot of debate. What are the Nephilim? Well, if you hold to the Nephilim are the offspring of divine beings and, and human women, right? They create the Nephilim. Most associate, under that reading, the Nephilim with the later Rephaim, okay, somehow. And most who buy into that Nephilim see them as sort of giants. That's probably the way you've always read that story. There were giants in the land. God sends a flood. Okay? So now what you have here is a retelling of that story on, on a smaller scale. In Genesis 6, the Nephilim seemingly are throughout the world, at least in the known world. Here, what you have in Canaan, where God has, has given over to Abraham in the covenant. But what we have here is a land of violence and giants. Go over to Genesis 6. You're going to see the same exact thing leading up to, to the flood. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the daughters of man were attractive. They took as their wives any they chose. The Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, his days 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Some of your old translations may say giants. Uh, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to these, these were mighty men who were of old men of renown, right? So, so you see the connection here. We have an age of violence, and violence is, is mentioned very clearly as, as you keep reading Genesis 6. You have an age of violence and giants in before Noah, and now you have a similar story with Abraham. So we've made a connection between Adam and Abraham. We also need to make a connect connection between Noah and Abraham. And this is one way of doing that. It's not the same story, but it's a very similar story. Because there, God judges the giants, if you will, if we just assume that reading. Here, God uses Abram 
to, to, to rescue Lot from the giants. He doesn't wipe them out, but he rescues Abram from the giants. Right. So, okay. So I, I want to show this in the Bible. Um, turn, will someone... Has anyone got King James? New King James? Will you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 2? ESV... Um, ESV translates. I, I, I think King James will transliterate. So whatever Bible you have, you turn to Deut- Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 20. I'm interested to see what, what word you have here. Uh, verse 20, sir? Yeah, verse 20. Chapter 2, verse 20. Do you have giants or Rephaim? It has giants in the uh, verse. I'll put the size of the says Okay, so you got a footnote. Good. Do you want to have... But it says giants in the text. Okay. So it's like ESV. Do you want to have um, Raphaim? So what do you have, Miss Mary? What translation? Okay, you got the Nazmi, the real Bible. And it says Raphaim. That's the Hebrew word. Lane, what do you got? ESV. Oh, this is King James. I'm sorry. Whenever I do word studies, it doesn't put it in ESV for me, and I'm too lazy to, to fix it. Okay, so ESV and NASB have Rephaim. King James, New King James, which is what I've switched to here, has giants. The Hebrew word Rephaim, among some other stuff, in a different other context, it means giants. Now, in different contexts, it can mean some other things, but it means giants. And so you'll see this all the time. So here's King James. They translate it as giants, but the Hebrew word is Raphaim. You'll notice in Deuteronomy 20, it has it back to back. That also was account a land of Raphaim, giants. Notice it, it, it's not a people group in terms of a nation. It's a description. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called on the Zamzumims. Well, I think that's the same people group. Remember, there's three groups, the Raphaim, the Elamites, and the uh, Zemzumines or whatever. I, I don't, you can't pronounce it either. So, so right there. So notice, they're coming into the promised land. And what do they find? There's giants in the land. And that's a big issue, right? Because it becomes an issue of faith. But if they knew their story, well, Abram encountered the same people. Uh, Deuteronomy 3, for only Og, now I know we've read this verse, Og, king of Bashan. Now remember, we talked about Bashan because this, this is where... Um, uh, the Rephaim Ashtaroth Karnaim, Ashtaroth was the capital city of Bashan, um, remained of the remnant of Rephaim, giants. Behold, his bedstead, this is Og, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not a, rat, a reboth of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length therein, and four cubits, that's a big bed. That's what she's supposed to say, right? He's a giant. The king of Bashan is a Rephaim, he's a giant. And this is what they're discovering as they come into the area. Deut- Deuteronomy 3, 3, 3, 3, 13, the rest of Gilead and all of Bashan, being the king of Og, gave I, this is clearly King James, half of the tribe of Manasseh, all the regions of Argob, with all of Bashan, which was called the land of Rephaim, the land of the giants. Joshua 12, um, and the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was of the remnant of the Rephaim, the giants. Um, Joshua 18, and the border came down to the end of the mountains that lieth, clearly King James, the valley of the son of Hinnon. Now, does valley of Hinnon sound familiar? You New Testament readers? It's where Gehenna gets its name. This is the place later on the kings of Israel will offer children to uh, Baal um, and commit infanticide. That later becomes a trash heap, which which becomes a, a, a lasting memorial and a picture of of hell. Gehenna was, was, it was a trash heap, constantly on fire. Jesus uses that as a metaphor. Um, but notice, and which is in the valley of the Rephaim, the valley of the giants. This term, valley of the Rephaim, is found throughout the Old Testament. It's, it's, a, it's a known place name. Uh, 2 Samuel 21, uh, and the ish Bebenob which was the sons of the Rephaim, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels. Now, what does that sound like? It sounds like Goliath. Well, David runs into the family, descendants, whatever, of Goliath, who himself is of Gath, probably a descendant of the Rephaim. That's where he comes from. Uh, 2 Samuel 21, there was yet a battle in Gath, 
where it was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and every foot six toes, so he could really do math. Um, he was born to the Rephaim, born to, to the giants. Um, similarly, the Emites, um, we, we see some of the same stuff. You can go back to Deuteronomy 2, the Emims, the Emites, dwelt therein in times past a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. That, the term Anakim, if we had time, we could really chase that rabbit, and it would get really trippy then. Because um, the Anakim actually show up in, in other writings, but you don't care. Next verse, which also were accounted Rephaim as the Anakims and the Moabites called them Emims. There's the reference to the Moabites. They also show up here in Genesis 14. So notice here, you have the Rephaim giants and the and the the Emites together associated with giants. So what you have then is you have the foreign kings going and defeating all these giants and everything else, which leaves the, 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 the five remaining... I get the four and five mixed up. The, 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 the local kings, they're, they're without a whole lot of help. So it's just, just them remaining, and they are going to go to, to war. Now, that this, is, this is significant in reading the story. So read the story as it is rather than as a modern reader. So we make a connection back to Genesis 6 with the Nephilim. We see that the earth, despite God cleansing it, is still full of violence, still full of hate. So Lot goes to find his garden. He ends up discovering a wilderness of violence. And this is the story of the land of Canaan. God calls Abram into a land of chaos who by grace will bring order. That's the story of Genesis in a nutshell. Remember, Genesis 1 in creation, God made the heavens and the earth, right? Verse 2, there's chaos in the land. There's, the Spirit of God hovers over the, the, the water. And what does he do? By each day, he pulls back from the chaos order. There is light. There is land. There is the living, right? He, he does this. What is God doing with Noah? He's bringing order out of chaos. Now what is he doing with Abraham? He's bringing order out of that chaos. And this chaos looks a lot like in the days of Noah, but God is keeping his promises. He's not going to destroy everyone. Rather, he's chosen one man. It was Noah, now it's Abram, to bring the Garden of Eden down in the middle of a wilderness. A wilderness, not just literally, remember the, the, the drought, but also spiritually. This is a, a spiritual wilderness of violence. And Abram will, actually notice where Abram is in the story. He's by a tree again. The Oaks of Mamre, we saw him there last week. We saw him in chapter 12. He is by the altar next to a tree. He's in his own garden. And all around him is wilderness. And now he is summoned to bring order out of this chaos. Now the chaos for him is Lot. Is, has been captured. So he, he's, he's going to rescue Lot. But this is Abram's job to take possession of the land. And this is going to be Israel's job, take possession of the land, extend the borders of this promised land to encompass the earth. What happens is the wilderness on the outside comes inside. And that's idolatry. That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. So yeah, these names are weird, and the story gets a bit trippy. I don't know what to do with giants. I don't. I'm just going to read the Bible, okay? You can find plenty of weird stuff online if you're really interested in this stuff. Um, but if you take the Bible face value, you can see what, what the biblical storytellers are, are doing. Um, so verses 8 to 12, the army said, we've really got to move. Um, the five local nations fight against the four invading armies. Uh, they're at a clear disadvantage because all their friends are, are taken over, um, and, and they lose. Uh, and so the battle is the battle of Sedim. Uh, verses 10 and 12 uh, tell this story. Um, the valley of Sedim was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. Does anyone have anything else there about the bitumen pits? that Did the kings fall into them? Did they jump into them? Do you have anything? Tar pits, yeah. And that, that's, that's a geographical thing we know with the Dead Sea. It's still like that today. Does it just say they fell into the tar pits? What does it say? They fell? You want to have anything different? Okay, so a couple of theories here. One is they lost because they fell into the tar pits. Okay? This is like, like uh, in Civil War, um, 
uh, that if, if you got stuck at the bottom, you know, because you, you didn't do your, your, your bombs right, uh, you could be setting ducks, right? And there was uh, uh, examples of that from Civil War, I think Civil War. Um, or having lost, some of the kings then jumped into the tar pits and died. Um, either one can work, uh, I, I believe. Um, but the term, the, the Hebrew is, when it describes the bitumen pits, the Hebrew literally reads pits, pits, tar. <laughs> In Hebrew, repetition is important because that's how you emphasize things. So the writer is saying, pits, pits, made of tar. Don't forget this. And then it says, oh, by the way, they jumped into it or they fell into it, whatever it was. And then, so just don't miss this, right? Every time you watch an action film, since this is an action scene, and you see someone cock a gun and the camera zooms in on that, it's going to be shot at some point in the movie, right? There was a movie I watched where they showed a guy put an, a rubber bullet into a rifle, a cop doing this, okay? And, and I didn't notice it. And then I went back and watched it. I thought, they just ruined the ending, right? Because you thought the guy died. It was just a rubber bullet, you know, and all that sort of stuff. I'm like, they just ruined it. I missed it the first time. But now that I know what happens, it's so obvious what they're doing. They're setting it up, right? Um, so... Uh, so you get the tar pits. Um, also, one other reason why I think that is mentioned. This is my theory. I'm probably wrong. But who's jumping into these pits? The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and these other cities. How do we know these cities? By what God does to them later. So here you have tar pits from below destroying them. Later, you have fire and brimstone from above destroying them. It's fascinating, isn't it? Now, I don't think I'm reading into that, but it really stuck out to me because we know what happens to them. So we see, yeah, so, so, so yeah, God's not going to flood the world again, but we see his act of judgment foreshadowed here. Um, and then Abram's going to go and rescue, um, rescue them. Um, and then, of course, Lot is taken there in verse 12. Um, he was in danger. Now he's in real danger, he and his entire family. Um, now, it's, it's, it's fascinating there. Now notice, Lot is a captive and his daughters and wife are at risk with him. What's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? He, in danger, now offers his daughters to the mom. So here he's endangered by foreign armies. Later he will endanger his own family to a place he set up camp. In fact, if you read where Lot is, remember last week we pointed this out. Lot is outside Sodom. Here he's seen in Sodom. And later on, during the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he is again inside Sodom. He keeps getting closer into it. Um, well, then, then we get the rescue, verses 13 and 16. Um, notice the language. Verse 13 is, is a quite a fascinating verse. Um, then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew... That's the first time we see the word Hebrew in the Bible. And it, 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 my reading of it is, it's a way to remind the reader, Abram is not a citizen of this land. The term implies alien, sojourner, oh, the Hebrew, the outsider, the guy that don't belong here. We, we do this today, right, uh, with, with various terms. Refugee, immigrant, uh, foreigner, visitor, traveler, tourist. It's, it's, we use terms to, to indicate you ain't from around here. And that's what this term is essentially doing. Um, I, it, I recorded today and the next two days devotion. So I, I think it's tomorrow's devotion. Christians are called the Nazarenes. I don't know if I've ever noticed that in the Bible. I've read through Acts a million times. But Christians are called the Nazarenes. It's supposed to be a derogatory term because that's the guy that was crucified. But I kind of like that term. And that's, that's where, probably where the Nazarenes get their name, the, the denomination. Um, but so something here similar is happening here with, with the Hebrew. So Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, um, pause there. Now, that term living is an important term. It implies he has pitched a tent and he's dwelling there. You, you, could, you could use the word dwelling. Dwelling may be a closer term than living. Right? Why is that important? In the Hebrew Bible, because this word for dwelling or living is the word that will be used later to describe the tabernacle. 
Remember, the tabernacle is the tent by which God dwells with his people. So what Abraham is doing here is he is dwelling, to use later tabernacle language, it's, it's being developed. We'll see this as we talk about Melchizedek in the next few weeks. The idea is being developed. It's not very clear here, but it's, it's being introduced. And notice again, he's by a tree. And here he's built the altar of the Lord, according to chapter 13. So we see a tent that will be associated with God's presence. We see it in the promised land by a tree, a specific tree, the Oaks of Mamre. So while Lot is, as we said, over there with the promised land, according to secular mankind studies, he's in a chaotic wilderness of violence. Abram is where the famine is, but he's dwelling really in his own, in his own Eden. And it's because he chooses faith. He chooses to live by faith. Um, and then, um, yeah. And so verse 13 introduces us to the allies. So Abram gets word, hey, this is all going up north. We should probably do something about it. So Abram gets these three allies, Mamre the, the, the Ammonite, Amorite rather, um, the brother of Eshcol, and of Anor. So, so that, that, that's your three allies. I don't know if I put them up here or not. No. Uh, so here, here's your three allies. Um, we don't really know much about these cats, but now what's going on here? The language here is that of, of covenant. God has cut a covenant with Abram. Abram has made a covenant with these other city states, these other people groups, people, uh, nations and whatnot in Canaan. That makes sense, right? If, if, if you're going to get along with your neighbors, you need to get along with your neighbors. And so they, they, they formed a posse, right? And basically what it is is if I'm in trouble, you're going to help me out. If you're in trouble, I'm going to help you out. And what did they do? They said, well, some of our folks are in trouble. One of them is Lot. So what you have is four on five is now going to be three against the five. And they're going to, 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 to team up and go. Now, read verses 14 and 16 again. All right, so we had the, 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 the battle of the, five, of the nine armies. Now we're going to have Abram's battle um, in verses 14 and 16. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants and defeated them and pursued them to Hobna, north of Damascus. He brought back all the, the possessions. Now, does this story sound familiar anywhere in the Bible? Break it down. Is there a, a, a man called by God to fight the enemy and he took 300 and some odd soldiers? David is a good example. There's one before David too. Gideon. Yeah, Dave, David does it because he's got his ragtag group of guys. Um, his, um, oh, the, what does he call the, those men? Uh, they stayed next, next to him forever. It's mighty men of valor. There you go. Yeah. So a very small group. I can't remember the number now, even though we preached on it last week or last year. But Gideon, he's got 300. Abram has 318. Now, that's a very precise number, and people try to go crazy with it. Do with it whatever you want. It's probably wrong anyways. 318. So very close to Gideon. How did Gideon win? He took his 300. He divided them in two and attacked. What does Abram do? He takes his 318, he divides them, and he attacks. Now, I don't think it's Abram's 318 to take over the larger army, which is a David and Goliath story. There's tons of these in the Bible. Remember, it's Abram's 318 plus his three allies, and they likely have large armies. Abram is not a king of a nation. He's a head of a household. Now, where did these, these trained soldiers come from? They're probably from Egypt. Probably. It's, it's not clear, but probably from Egypt, because that is how he really got enriched. Now, here, that story helps him. Later, with Hagar's, it's, it's really going to, to hurt him. So, close this out. What do we do with this? Well, we talked about the Eden narrative and wilderness and all that with Lot and Abram. That's, 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 a, that's a broad approach to the story. What else? Why else does this story matter? It is a picture of the gospel. It's a clear picture of the gospel. Chances are, you and I would prefer the word rescue here. Abram leaves his home, 
in the presence of God, right? The oaks of memory, the altar of the Lord, the tent, encampment. He's going to leave the presence of God to go rescue Lot, who is in the wilderness of violence. But what if you change the word rescue to redemption? Does the story and interpretation change? Because it is a type of redemption. Now, redemption is usually done by financial means. It's, it's being a kinsman redeemer, like a story of Ruth, where you're wealthy enough to, to buy the land and, and, and redeem Naomi and Ruth. Or it's going to come um, by, by other means. You're going to set a, uh, a, a captive free or set a slave free, like the story of Philemon, where Paul says, I will pay anything he owes you. Usually redemption involves some sort of financial exchange. Here it isn't financial, so it's not with the purse, it's with the sword. But it's redemption nonetheless. What has Lot done? Lot has chosen for himself what he believes, uh, following his own wisdom, heaven, the Garden of Eden. This is the sin of Eve. She believes that in taking of the fruit and giving into temptation, she can make for herself her own garden. She will be wise like God. Lot does the same thing. Abram, on the other hand, he's in the presence of God, must leave that comfort and then go rescue, go redeem Lot from captivity. By his sacrifice, will he risk, he risk the entire covenant here, doesn't he? If he dies, the covenant's over with. He risks all of that to set Lot free. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. Now, the difference is Jesus is a true and better Abram, of course, because Jesus didn't risk his life like Esther. He gave his life for us. And also we see what does Lot do with his redemption? He puts himself back in the same situation. And there he'll come under the judgment of God. But you can see the pattern is being set up for us. God is making a covenant with Abram. And it is through his line, the offspring we talked about, chapters 12 and 13, is not offsprings, will come the one who will truly bring rescue, who will truly bring redemption. That's the good news of this story. Don't worry about the names or the giants. Worry about the one who slays giants, the true and better David, who's a true and better Abram. Does that make sense? Hope so. It's a beautiful story. But next week, we'll start the story of Melchizedek, and we'll answer all the questions after I have Danny answered them for you, right? Because if you've been in his Sunday school class, he's dealt with Melchizedek. And I know he's as confused as I am. But there's a lot going on there, even if you can't answer all the questions. So I'm really looking forward to that. But hey, look at here, a good action scene. It's about time, right? A good one. We got fighting and everything. He goes and saves the girl, right? Go gets Lot's wife, gets her saved. Of course, she was a real pillar of the community, as Mark reminds us, right? All right. Any questions to dodge? That was a salty comment. Thank you, thank you. It's the season for it. We could do this all night if you want to. I know. <laughs> all right. Well, since we still.